The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. Wealth is about more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. NetWealth is supporting financial literacy and education in primary schools through Banker, a fun, interactive platform for children to learn about money. So far, we have sponsored and given over 100,000 children in Australia free access and want to reach even more. Discover a world of community at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. To give listeners of the Advice Tech Podcast another avenue to solve technology problems that matter most and efficiently evaluate the landscape of advice tech providers, Ensemble has launched an advice tech space on its platform. If you want to know how your advice peers are solving their tech challenges, big and small, it's the place to go. Head to the Ensemble platform or use the link in the show notes to join today. Today we're talking bridging the gap between practices and platforms with Sean Green, CEO at Elementa. So Elementa sits in the middle of the two, solving the problem of non-standard data and a lack of data integration in the wealth management industry, a problem that Sean lived firsthand through building out Advice Revolution, which you may be familiar with as a digital fact-finding and client portal solution. He takes us through how they are now working with institutions to streamline the process of account opening and account maintenance using the data within your financial planning CRM and bringing structure and simplicity into the industry. You think about it now, you can have the most integrated, streamlined and well-run tech stack. But once a product provider gets involved from an implementation or a maintenance perspective, it's when the friction begins and that's the exact problem Elementor is trying to solve. I started by asking Sean what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Yeah, good question. Well, like I just moved house uh, last month and I stumbled across an iPhone 6 oh. and a couple of other I- older iPods. So um, they're definitely the oldest. I have not used them for, for many years. Yeah, well, just just them. the friction involved with an iPod these days, that would just take, really? I don't know, <laughs> an hour or so, plug it in and get your tracks. It's just, I can't even think about how that worked in the past. Anyway, yeah. that's that's a great couple of tips. Um, and it may be one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your work life. Yeah, look, um, I think along with the rest of the world, I was pretty blown away when chat GPT-3 came onto the scene um, and a bit mind blown as to, to where things could go. Um, it might be a bit of a controversial statement, but um, you know, whilst it's added, whilst AI has added value in some really specific point solutions, I've been a bit disappointed, really, myself, that the sort of progress that it's achieved at a macro level. Yeah, you know, I certainly in our industry, I don't see it solving for the core sort of administration and compliance burdens of the industry. Um, if you look at Wall Street, you're seeing a lot of them start to question the amount of capital that's been poured behind that. Um, I think I, I read one article that suggested it would need to produce somewhere in the realm of $600 billion of revenue to justify wow. just what's been spent today, let alone what's coming. Um, and an Economist article I saw yesterday, I, I, actually, I don't have the subscriptions, so I haven't read it, but um, yeah. they called out that it said it's basically achieved no economic impact whatsoever. So I hope I'm busted in one's bubble there, but um, in terms, for those who are uh, there with the hype, but my, my sense is it's going to be something like you know, the, the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s, huge bubble. Um, it's probably going to bust. Um, the, the value of that technology will come, but it's going to take a lot longer to arrive than people probably, certainly that I, I assumed um, initially. And um, when you look at how much capital is being spent, I think it's going to be the big tech players that are the ones who can continue to spend that sort of money for a sustained period of time and, and will come out on top. Um, yeah. I, I saw... 
I think it was a, a comment from from Google that was saying that the risk of sort of being not being at the forefront far outweighs the risk of spending any more money. So they're just like pouring the money wow. in that direction. So yeah, I've been doing a little bit of research on that. Um, it's a really interesting space, and I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I tend to agree. I think the only sort of use cases that I have at the moment are using it for sort of back-end processes and automation, like getting it involved in the back-end. So it, it's doing that sort of magical stuff that no one even knows is happening and it's really uh, accelerating, especially things like formatting data or being able to extract data. It's really good at that when you give it the right prompts and, and do that correctly. But, yeah, I'm with you. At the moment, especially tools like Copilot or even a simple Google search just comes back so general and just so full of guff that it's just not worth looking at. Yeah. Yeah, and no, that's going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm sure it will come, but I think people will be uh, disappointed. It might take a little bit longer than than ever than the hype suggests at the moment. Yeah, I'm with you. Speaking of interesting, Sean, keen to learn about your origin story, mate. And so, where did you start out professionally, and, and what's led you to Elementor? Yeah, look, um, I'm actually st- I'm from Newcastle. Uh, I was a third generation family manufacturing business. So I was in the building industry. Um, sweeping the floor at 15 through to running one of the factories and doing some sales. Yeah, so really I, I was always interested in finance um, as the third generation came through. The industry and the businesses weren't really doing as well as they had in the past and it was really a sort of a, a moment where we had to decide what we're going to do and, and all of the third generation decided to pursue other opportunities and I, you know, I went into, into finance Short, short instance, uh, short stint. Sorry, in business banking, and then as an advisor, uh, and then spent probably a decade in the institutional world and in wealth, um, mainly at uh, AMP, but a little bit of time at BT Westpac as well. Um, so that, that was my background. Uh, got excited and enthusiastic about uh, starting my own business. So this journey began with the intent to launch a financial advice practice. Uh, just as we we're about to sort of kick that off, after I'd already sort of adjusted my employment to half time. Uh, the yes. Royal Commission hit and I was sitting inside AMP watching AMP on the stands of the Royal Commission going, Oh my God, how did I how did I get this timing so so bad? And um, that that led us to focus on some te- some of the technology issues and and we probably bring to market one of the first digital fact finds in the industry yep. under the Advice Revolution brand. That that evolved to become a client portal with full two-way push and pull of, of their fact find data and, and other uh, features as well. Um, and and ultimately, it was that, I guess, the integration capability that sat behind that app that became the, the really special source for us. We, we probably over-engineered that for the purposes of our client portal, but what it's really um, provided us with is really best-in-market um, data platform and data integration platform that can solve uh, any range of issues in, in ways that others uh, in the market can't today, which is really exciting. And uh, so the Elementor, Elementor Group brand was launched about probably close to 12 months ago now, uh, ahead of a, a launch of some capability to market in November in partnership with CFS. So it's been a long winding journey, but um, yeah, we've got a, a really exciting future ahead of us. Yeah, awesome. No, thank you for sharing that. That's a, a incredibly fascinating story, and you've obviously <laughs> done it all. Um, yeah. I mean, do you mind sort of talking a little bit more about Elementor, like what that means now, like what problems are you solving, and and why do you feel there's a need for it? Yeah, look, I mean, we're an Australian-based software company. We, we focus on integrating data and and providing solutions that leverage that platform capability. Um, we've got over 50 staff this year. We've been sort of going um, from the original Advice Revolution beginning since 2018. The, the problem of non-standard data and data integration is is rife across the world in wealth management. Um, and we we lived that firsthand when we were trying to bring that client portal to market. Um, as I said, we probably didn't plan it uh, purely in that it was we sort of struck gold with the integration um, platform that we built for our own purpose. Uh, but there, there is any number of um, friction points and inefficiencies in in the process for advisors and their clients, um, whether it's dealing with um, data to their clients, whether it's dealing with data to the product manufacturing side of the world. Yeah, it, it's a real eye opener to us just how how big the opportunity is in that space and. You know, you've seen other players in the market have start tried to, I guess, in the past, try to differentiate themselves by offering more 
integrated solutions. Yeah. Um, often that might have bought, bought up the companies and bring things together. Um, I think the uh, pendulum is swinging the other way now that it's not really a differentiator and there's you know players like us coming to market offering that as an infrastructure type solution and so um, it can it can enable particularly the product manufacturers to um, license that capability and focus their capital investments in other areas where they can truly differentiate um, and add more value um, to advisors. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting space. It is. It is very interesting. And you, you mentioned non-standard data. I assume we'll just unpack that a little bit more. You're even talking about this at a advisor or practice level, right? If you're talking about advice revolution and and you know fact finding. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, even in the compliance frameworks that advisors have to operate under, yep. there's so much variance in in their CRMs. You know, it's plan. 60 odd percent of the market. I think we have over 100 different X plane instances that are integrated and configured in our platform. Yeah. Um, where people have gone and made, to varying degrees, an enormous amount of change to drop down category fields, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. and all the other different options yeah. you could have, um, or fully rebuilt the, the goals modules um, or, you know, um, various different aspects of the database. And so, when you have that, it makes it very difficult for one system to, to natively talk to the other. And yeah, it, it's it's really holding the industry back. It's a, it's a global problem and uh, we're leaning into it here in this market. And if, you know, if we want to make quality advice accessible to more of the population, then, you know, um, our job is to, to solve for this part of it. That's it's our focus and to, to really educate the market, I guess, on how big that problem actually is because... Um, in our experience, you know, whether it's AI or other things that are the buzzwords that get all the attention, for, yeah. um, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the the benefit that they might provide might be a, a little way off and the opportunity to solve these core, f- you know, foundational issues is here right and now. And, and so, yeah, we want to do our part in that and, and help the whole system. No, I love it. And I'm just sort of thinking at a micro level in our business, all it takes is one, you know, pick list value. So a little option in a field just not being the same or consistent with another system and the whole thing bloody fails. Totally, You're talking about yeah. that with, with every business in Australia plus all the third parties and related entities that go along with that. Totally. And, and you know, um, yeah, at a, if I think about some of the interviews and the research we've done, um, some of the most efficient and tech-enabled practices in the market um, have really standardised how they operate. Um, often they're playing in a, a lower um price bracket, you know, with higher volumes and lower margins. And they've really done an enormous amount to, to let their businesses operate to that level. But the moment that they then have to interface with a, an external party like a product manufacturer, then all of that ends. And, and they have to learn the unique individual nuances of not just the product, but the systems and the processes of how that gets implemented or managed. And it just breaks everything that they've built in their system. And yeah, you know, that that's on on, on one side of it. Um, but what, what our software does is it can basically pull in data in the format of the, the source system, translate it into standard data model or often called a universal data model, yep. and then it can be translated and, and pushed out to the destination system. Um, and we can do that uh, from one system to another through that, that middleware or we can take data from multiple systems and, and push it into one or from one and push it into multiple. So there's, I guess there's the translation and, and the um, orchestration aspects of that. And when you have that capability, you can you can automate an enormous yeah. amount of human uh, activity. Um, you can repurpose data and avoid errors. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really core f- foundational problem that doesn't get the, the focus yeah. or awareness um, in, in the market. Yeah, it, it feels like a real picks and shovel approach to solving that problem. If you're thinking about AI where you've got, as you mentioned, all that money going into it where a lot of the money is also going into you know buying up data centers and, and just building up that capacity for that to actually work and, and be you know viable long term. No, I really love the approach and just it sort of links to my next question. Like your website has this great line where it just simply says, every problem we solve is backed by our authentic experiences and lessons learned from the front lines, ensuring we offer genuine solutions for complex industry challenges. So there's, there's definitely merit in 
an unrelated third party looking at a problem with fresh eyes. But how important is it that you have a deep understanding of the industry or have actually lived that exact problem? I'm referencing your origin story now, Sean, yeah. that you're trying to solve. Yeah, look, I think it depends on the context. In plenty of other scenarios you could think of, that complete fresh perspective might help somebody to see something in, in an entirely different way, right? There's no question. But in wealth, I, I just don't think that that's the case. There's, there's yep. just so much nuance in the data. It's a highly regulated environment. There's so many things that you see when, when you would come in, you you would think, but you, just, you don't know that there's all these barriers and roadblocks to to those ideas that, that would seem seem like a great idea to somebody that didn't understand all of that detail. So I think in our industry, um, yeah, it, it really is very critical that you understand the the use case and the experience that's going on in the practice. Um, because even if you look at the advisor community, the nuances in the advisor community, the types of clients they serve, the the service proposition they provide, it is, it is so nuanced. And so you, you absolutely, I think in this case, yeah. you, well, for more than any scenario I can think of, you, you know, you really need to have that experience. Um, but at the same time, you know, bring some fresh thinking to the table as well. Yeah. I guess speaking of fresh thinking, um, you know, once you've, I'm not saying once you've sold wealth, but in solving that problem, does that then enable, you know, the end businesses to then maybe integrate better with their own business divisions? Because normally you've got, if we're talking about, you're talking about advice revolution and over a hundred plus customized X plan sites. I assume in those businesses, they're actually holding back the other business divisions by, you know, we've got to use this CRM over here, whereas the other, it might be accounting or lending or whatever other division it is, is being held back from becoming this one sort of source of truth a business that's running in the same direction. Look, at the moment, commercially, our focus is on working with product manufacturers um, and to solve uh, the friction that sits between the practice and the implementation of product or the maintenance of product. Um, but you're quite right. You, you know, you look at practices, whether they're just purely in advice practice or multidisciplinary practice, they're using a growing number of technologies in their practice. And, and if you add products to that, again, it's, it's growing even further. Um, and, you know, there are challenges with using, diff- there's benefits to using, you know, best of breed software, but there's challenges that come with that as well. And it's certainly a space that we see a big opportunity to help help solve for as well. That that use of data across systems, um, the automation of um, tasks across applications, uh, the ability to, um, I guess, have a decentralized source of truth across your business. Right. So yeah. if I just take a really s- simple scenario to explain that. If, if you take um, X Plane holding the core data on on the client, but if they've got an SMSF, then you might want to take the SMSF data from class, right, or whatever the other system is, um, because you know that it's going to be more accurate or more pure. Yeah, well, you know, our platform has the capability to facilitate that as a, a, on a standing basis, or for you to pick and choose, you know, source down to the individual field level in a, in an individual use case for for an individual product application, for example. You know, yeah. um, and so. If you think about the flexibility that that provides, um, it, it can allow practices to really choose the software that they want to that they want to drive in the business, and to overcome a lot of the challenges that that are faced today, and and to overcome a lot of the capital investment that would be required, and they're probably being made by some of the bigger firms in the market yeah. to address that for themselves. Our experience in, in dealing with institutions is you bring this capability in, and you can save them hell of a lot of time and money in actually achieving those outcomes themselves. And yeah, we definitely see the opportunity to bring that to practice, you know, to the advice practice market in terms of their own yep. internal tech stack. Yeah. And everyone wins. I'm totally with you. I mean, just on institutions, have you got any sort of case studies or examples for us, Sean, of maybe a problem that is being faced and, and how it's been solved or approached? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, our major turning point um, towards the institutions occurred in, in 2022. Um, we knew that the opportunity um, presented by integrations platform was, was very significant. We spent a large engagement with Colonial First State. Um, they had a couple of years before received a big investment from KKR um, who had you know bought the majority of the asset off CBA and was looking to renovate that and, and obviously put it back on the market with the typical private equity play. Um, we 
uh, that, that invested heavily in the Edge platform that you may be aware of in the yeah. market, um, supported by FNZ. Um, and they wanted to do something with First Choice, which is obviously their primary solution. They got about 130 billion sitting on that product, and Edge is, is a new entrant to the market. I think they've broken a billion recently. Um, and so we, we got an opportunity to really solve a pain point um, on, on the First Choice product. Um, we looked at a range of options and ended up with the product origination. Um, so the process today was either paper forms or, or uh, you know, PDF form, yeah, yeah. Um, and in many cases more than one form that needed to be completed to set up and do any of the actions that you might do in, in setting up an account, rollovers and, and other things that might need to take place. Um, and so we, we uh, digitized that whole process um, in, a, in a really effective way, essentially – it was redesigned from the advisor's perspective. So rather than, again, being, you know, how the product manufacturer yeah. sought to receive the information, the whole the whole design of it was from how does an advisor think about advice? What's the flow of an SOA? How would they be natively sort of go through the journey um, to complete the information? And, um, yeah, it, it was received really well by market, by advisors, very intuitive to use, but the advisor has the ability to pull through source data from X plan. Oh wow! Um, and um, to to use that data in the account origination process, um, the time savings I think it range from fifty to eighty percent of the advisor's time uh, are reduced in in the setup process. And practices have told us that um, that the benefit of reusing their data to avoid errors is just as powerful for them as the time savings because once you you know, once the train comes off the track, so to speak, yeah. you're outside of a standard process and, um, you know, they've then got to unwind a problem with a third party that can be very time consuming uh, or, or funds could be invested in the market and, and that creates other issues as well. So, yeah. uh, it, it's been a huge um, success for us and, and for CFS and it's been a great partnership. Um, they've seen practices that support their product really increase the support to their product as a result of the ease of implementation and the ease of doing business. And I think just symbolically that that they really are focused on trying to help practices in that way. Um, and so yeah, it's been a, it's been a really um, a really great result, and um, we're, yeah, it's something we're absolutely excited to to tackle more of those friction points that sit between advisors and, and the product manufacturers. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. And that is just one example of of double entry that you just can't muck up. Like we, we say you probably can't muck it up in any case, but that's one great example of if you're giving that to a third party, as you mentioned, funds being invested, um, accounts being open, you know, trustees getting involved, like you just need to get that right. And the fact that you've been able to um, integrate at least, you know, two of the big hitters in terms of financial planning CRMs into that process I assume makes everyone's life easier. That's just awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we got we got recognised by Suitability Hub as one of the top three innovations of 2023 in the platform market. Two of those were more investment product focused. So ours was the only integration automation solution that was called out, um, and we were we uh, got two finalist positions in the Finneys as well. Um, one for wealth awesome. management and one for the uh, corporate startup sort of collaboration. I think. Um, so yeah, it's been been really well received and a, and a huge success for everybody involved, and certainly um, for advisors. No, brilliant. And I mean, do you see do you see that evolving over time as well? Like, I assume at the moment that's quite a guided process in terms of fields have come through. You can see the data that's been populated. Do you see that process being fully automated all the way to placing investments in terms of back end, or do you see that sort of um, you know blended experience progressing for a lot longer? I'd say blended more so, but it but it can, absolutely can be, and, okay. and I think we'll get to full automation. You know, it it would be possible um, that we could um, provide that that capability, so that for example, one of those practices that have done all the automation and and set up their world, you know, that they could sort of programmatically execute um, on product. That that's possible. I mean, um, we've we've got some more capability that's about to. Um, uh, hit hit the market, so I can't say too much yeah. about that. But there's nat there's natural extension of that, um, and other friction that you can take out of that process, both um, in the new account creation, but also you know in ongoing maintenance of accounts. Um, setting up a new account is a, is a lot of work, and there's a lot of friction to take out. But 
if you think about most advisors, most of their revenue and most of their clients are ongoing clients that are already in production and just yeah. need the various maintenance activities that take place. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of friction there and it's a space that we're really excited about. Yeah, and especially maintenance in those sort of legacy platforms that you can't actually get them out of because of whatever reason. I'm totally with you and it's just, yeah, a, a bugbear for everyone. I think I think automation would have to be my favourite part of my role at Collins SBA and the impact that, that has on team members and just making their life easier. Um, you know, whether that's something that happens on a schedule or triggered, et cetera, but when, you know, when something else happens, but it might be as simple as when a client is created in one system that creates them in 10 other systems that's in the tech stack. And apart from, you know, generative AI, it's probably the closest thing that we have to magic, or at least in my life. Um, (laughs) What would you say, Sean, is your favorite or the most rewarding part of being involved with Elementor? Maybe you probably already told us with that case study, but are there any other examples of of what sort of gets you out of bed in the morning to make these sort of changes and improvements? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the success with CFS was, was symbolic and a big milestone for us and for them, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think most people in this industry understand the value of quality advice. Um, we understand that it's getting harder and harder for consumers to access that at scale and at a price that's relevant. And so, you know, we're just really excited by the opportunity to solve such a fundamental issue. You know, we use the language walk before you run. Um, yeah. If you solve the interconnectivity, the integration, the interoperability um, and the automation factors um, from not from an app-centric standpoint, but as, a, as that middleware type um, position, you can create um, not just enormous efficiency benefits and, and accuracy benefits as we talked about, but but you also pave the way for some of those more advanced um, technologies as they come through to really get full full leverage in the system. So, yeah, yeah we, we look at it as something that, that is going to have enduring and, and very significant impact on the industry, um, which is, is going to benefit, you know, all participants for sure, but, but absolutely consumers and, and the ability for them to access advice and have all of the benefits that come from that um, at all ages. But, you know, uniquely we've got a huge sort of retirement wave hitting, hitting the uh, – the population at the moment and so you know it's a, it's a really exciting time to yeah. play a part in that as well no it definitely is and you're solving the root actual root cause of the problem so you're, you're doing incredible work and if we sort of go maybe back to the micro level for the you know the business owner or the the person the champion that's doing all the you know managing the tech stack or the automation in the business have you got any tips or examples for businesses when it comes to integration and automation? Like where do you start and maybe some quick wins from an integration or, or automation perspective if you have any? Yeah, look, it's a good question. It's a big question, which is why I sort of um, paused when you, when you asked. Um, look, I think the reality is that there is, what, what I would call out is there is an enormous power in this space and I think yeah. people need to really understand that. And again, that's something we're trying to educate the market and support the market to understand and, and support you know, to help solve for that problem as well. But if you recognize that is the case and if you recognize that the world is moving in a direction where things are going to be more integrated, where they're going to be more interoperable across systems, where things will be able to automated more, you know, that, that might change the way you actually think about, you know, the tech stack that you have today or the tech stack that you're moving towards. Um, and, and as that... Um, you know, integration across systems, even if you think within a practice as tech stack, becomes more and more um, commonplace and capable, then it, it's it's going to enable practices to get the full benefit of that kind of best of breed tech stack. So um, it, it's it's a tough question to answer because it depends on where you are today and, and where you hope to go and, and what your business looks like. But, you know, the main thing that I would call out is just how much benefit we are seeing in that space and that this and this world is is coming and so you know it's certainly something that you want to keep in in top of mind yeah um and from a you know from a product manufacturing standpoint um i think you're going to see more and more investment and focus in this space and so if if this is a if the, if, if there's products that you're supporting in the market that are you know that are not keeping up with the pack in this space then yeah, you know, this is an opportunity, I guess, for people to to call that out to their BDMs and and really make it known um, because the benefits are, are very material. 
Tallegre, and I think I'm just sort of thinking of my own tips. I would probably say that like, just keep it as simple as you can. Like really question if if an advisor is coming to you asking for you know a custom field here, another drop down <laughs> here, etc. Maybe just really try and as you've obviously done at a really grand scale, Sean, try and you're addressing the root problem, the root cause. Try and do that and ask more questions of the advisor as to why they really need to go into the, go down that path because then you end up with as you mentioned, those 100 plus connected um, custom X plan sites to tools that you built in the past, like Advice Revolution, and just get your data in order first and make sure that once this, um, you know, as we talked about, you know, AI actually starts to do stuff that's beneficial, you've got your data there, you trust it, you've got your source of truth, and you can actually press go rather than spend, you know, another six or 12 months cleaning your data, either manually or whatever. But yeah, I totally. Think that's what I'd say. Look, um, I think um, for various reasons, the pendulum swung to everyone wanting to do it their own way and customize the hell out of X plan for various reasons. But you know, I, I think it's very clear that certainly the software providers in the market, as everything is starting to connect up, are cognizant and recognizing the problem that that is, and and things are swinging back the other way. Um, I, I think the change is going to happen relatively quickly. Yeah. Um, but you know, some players are going to lead the pack. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm with you. And you know, speaking of change and and maybe anything in addition to what we've already spoken about, but is there anything that's got you excited about the future of integration and automation, Sean? Uh, look, as I said before, really, that the, there is a clear problem and an enormous benefit sitting there today. Yeah. Um, but the next phase of what technology can bring can really leverage that, and, and so yeah. I hate to bang on the AI after I mentioned it um, yeah. so strongly in, in the opening comments, but you know, um, things like that are going to be able to really give their full force if if this sort of interconnected world exists. Um, we see uh, we see that as a as a middleware sort of space, and 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 the beauty of of being in that position for us is that you know, you, arguably, you're not in competition with everybody. Anybody, you're you're a friend to everybody, and and what a great a great space to be in commercially. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as as we continue to do our bit, and as everybody else in the market continues to do their bit, it will it will drive in more or less change in in the industry. And yeah, that I think that excites everybody that that understands it. Totally, Sean. I've really enjoyed our discussion today. What's the best way to progress the conversation if someone wants to? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, look, if anyone wants to reach out, um, obviously you can jump on the website elementor.com. Uh, contact details are there. Uh, obviously, I'm Sean Green, the co-founder and CEO. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, we, uh, yeah, we we really focused on that. I guess the product manufacturing side of the market at this point in our journey. Um, there, there's plenty of opportunities for us to to focus and solve problems at that practice level. Um, but at the moment, yeah, it's just worth calling out. That's the core focus for the business. Perfect, Sean. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Patrick.